All right, so welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're going on a journey through the life and work of, well, Isaac Newton. And we're using his Wikipedia page kind of as like our roadmap, you know. Yeah, think of us as your guides through this uh, sometimes pretty dense forest of information. We're going to help you navigate it, point out the coolest landmarks, all that. Exactly. We want to help you see the forest for the trees, as they say. And hopefully make sure you leave with a solid understanding of what makes Newton's work so important, even like centuries later. Right. So Isaac Newton, born 1642, England. Right in the middle of the English Civil War, actually. Yeah. It makes you wonder, right, how much that kind of chaotic environment might have influenced his worldview. Oh, definitely. And, you know, his childhood, uh, it wasn't exactly peaceful either, personally speaking. I mean, just imagine being, like, abandoned by your mother at three years old. And then going to live with your grandmother for over a decade, only to go back to your mom when you're, like, 15 after your stepfather dies. That's, yeah, that's a lot for a young kid to go through. I mean, do you think those early experiences, like contributed to his later tendency to be kind of solitary? Yeah, maybe. I mean, we can't know for sure, obviously, but it's definitely possible. Events like that, they often leave a mark, you know? It's like, um, almost like he channeled all that early instability into this, like, relentless pursuit of order and understanding, but in the natural world. That's a really interesting take. And even as a kid, right, it seemed like his scientific mind was like already working remember that thing in the wikipedia entry about him building all those intricate toys oh, yeah the windmills and the sundials even like mechanical carriages definitely a hands-on learner right from the start and then there's that little tidbit about his childhood sweetheart miss story but they never ended up marrying seems their paths kind of diverged when newton decided to go for an academic career at cambridge back then that often meant celibacy you know they stayed friends though huh so from building windmills in a village to being at C Cambridge, one of the like top universities in the world, what a shift. I know, right? Going from a simple rural life to suddenly being surrounded by all these like brilliant minds, the debates, the literature, philosophy. It says a lot about him, though, that he not only survived that change, but like totally thrived. Yeah. And ultimately ended up, you know, revolutionizing our understanding of the universe. Totally. And get this, he was such a bookworm that even though he was like generally frugal with his money, he was willing to splurge on books. And scientific equipment, right? Yeah. Anything to feed his intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to his work in optics, which is really where he starts to, you know, make a name for himself. Right. Like 1672, he publishes his first scientific paper in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, no less. Huh. Detailing all those experiments with prisms and, you know, his revolutionary discovery about about light. Ah, the famous prism experiment showing that white light. It's actually a mix of all these different colors, which he was able to, like, separate and then put back together again, all with prisms. Yeah, completely challenged what everyone thought they knew about light and color back then. Like, before Newton, people assumed color was somehow added to white light. He proved the colors were already in there, just waiting to be revealed. <laughs> Amazing how such a simple experiment can, like, overturn centuries of, you know, scientific dogma. Totally. And you know what? This whole thing with the prisms, it led him to invent the reflecting telescope. Which is still used today. It's incredible. Yeah. He realized that um, refracting telescopes, the ones that use lenses, they cause this problem called chromatic aberration. Basically, the colors get distorted. So he figured, why not replace the lens with a curved mirror? To focus the light instead. Yeah. And bam, clear images. Mm -hmm. But what about his particle theory of light? Didn't later scientists figure out that uh, that wasn't the whole picture? Yeah, you're right. They discovered later that light, it also acts like a wave. This whole wave-particle duality thing, it's like central to quantum mechanics. Obviously, that wouldn't be fully understood for centuries. But his work laid some of the groundwork, right? It's yeah. like, it makes you wonder, what would he have done with today's technology? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so we've got the optics thing going on. But then in 1679, he switches gears back to this topic he'd messed with before gravity. What's interesting, though, is how all his different interests seem to, like, connect, you know? It's like his understanding of light and how it behaves probably shaped his view of gravity. As a force that can act over distances. So it wasn't just a random shift, but, like, more of him continuing to, like, try to figure out the fundamental laws of the universe. Right. And then, boom, 1687, he publishes his... Uh, masterpiece, I guess you could say, the Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica. The Principia, as it's often called. This, like, totally revolutionized how people saw the universe. 
and in it, he lays out the three laws of motion. Inertia, acceleration, action, reaction. And introduce the law of universal gravitation. I mean, those laws of motion, were they like hard for people back then to wrap their heads around? Oh, I'm sure. I mean, they seem pretty basic to us now, but that's because we kind of grew up with them, you know? But back then, the idea that the same force that makes an apple fall is also what keeps the planets in orbit, that was like mind-blowing. Yeah, he basically unified how we understand motion, both on Earth and in space. Huge accomplishment. And, you know, he was actually the first to use the term gravitas. Which is Latin for weight, right? Yep. He literally gave a name to this force that shapes the entire universe. It's like he wasn't just discovering laws, but like creating the language to describe them, too. It's pretty amazing. It really is. When you think about it, one person's mind having that kind of impact. Yeah. But his brilliance didn't stop at science. He was also super into philosophy and religion, wasn't he? Oh, absolutely. For Newton, science and religion, they weren't separate things at all. Like, he saw his scientific work as a way to understand God's creation. Right. Exactly. He was a devout Christian, although his views were um, a little unorthodox, let's say. Okay, so let's dig into that a bit. What made his religious beliefs so different? Well, he basically challenged the whole doctrine of the Trinity. He argued for, like, one God, the Father... And that Christ was divine but subordinate. That was a pretty risky stance back in 17th century England. Uh, I mean, religious dissent could get you in serious trouble. No kidding. So, yeah, it seems like he kept a lot of these views to himself, probably out of fear. It's a good reminder even the most brilliant people have to deal with the, you know, the social and political pressures of their time. It makes you think about how that kind of pressure might have, like, influenced his work. Yeah. What he chose to make public, what he kept private. Yeah, definitely food for thought. It's kind of wild, though, right, that someone so devoted to, like, reason and observation would also get into something like alchemy. Yeah, that whole thing always kind of throws me off. It seems paradoxical, doesn't it? Well, we got to remember, 17th century, right, alchemy wasn't seen as, like, totally out there, completely separate from real science. So it was more like just another way to uh, explore the properties of matter. Right, exactly. And maybe even, you know, like transform stuff like turning lead into gold ha huh, exactly but for newton it wasn't just about getting rich right it was more about understanding the the fundamental nature of matter and the forces at play in the universe like he thought those ancient alchemical texts they held secrets and alchemy was the key to unlocking them Right. So in a way, his science and his alchemy, they were both driven by that same desire to, like, figure out the hidden order of things. Makes sense. He was always searching for deeper truths, whether it was through uh, observation experiments or by diving into those old texts. Totally. I mean, it's a good reminder that even the most, like, groundbreaking thinkers, they're still products of their time. Shaped by the beliefs and the intellectual trends around them. Speaking of which, it's pretty amazing how Newton's discoveries went beyond science, right? Totally. Like, they influenced culture, philosophy, even political thought. Okay, I'm curious. How did his work have that kind of impact outside of science? Well, take his laws of motion and gravity, for example. They really help solidify this idea of the universe as a kind of clockwork. You mean like a perfectly designed machine? Exactly. And that idea, it became central to the Enlightenment. Which was this, like huge period of intellectual change in Europe. Yeah, a major shift. People started to see the universe not as something mysterious or unpredictable, but as something operating according to these fixed, like, unchanging laws. And those laws could be understood through reason and observation. Right, which had, like, huge implications for how people thought about society. Like, if the universe runs like a well-oiled machine, maybe human society can too. That's a fascinating point. I hadn't thought about it that way. So his work, it kind of fueled this idea of social progress and... Uh... I guess even political reform. Absolutely. It shows just how powerful ideas can be. Like, they shape how we see the world and ultimately how we organize ourselves within it. Pretty profound. But let's not forget, Newton, he was also, well, human, right? I mean, we talked about those times when he got really paranoid. Oh, yeah. And his rivalry with uh, with Leibniz. Ah, uh, yes, the infamous calculus feud. Like, even brilliant minds can get caught up in, you know, ego and the pursuit of recognition. But it's interesting, though, right? Because it seems like they both came up with calculus independently. You're right, they did. Like, different methods, different notations. But Newton, he wasn't exactly keen on sharing credit. He used his position in the Royal Society 
to basically try to discredit Leibniz. And claim sole ownership of calculus. I guess even a genius can be, you know, insecure or jealous. It happens. But in the end, both Newton and Leibniz made huge contributions to mathematics. Contributions that have, you know, shaped countless scientific advancements since then. That's true. Okay, so we've covered a lot here. Newton's childhood, his breakthroughs in optics, his work on gravity, those uh, kind of unorthodox religious beliefs, the influence he had on the Enlightenment, even his alchemy, and that whole rivalry with Leibniz. Anything else we should touch on before we, uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge that Newton, well, he wasn't always right. True. I mean, some of his theories, they've been revised or even like completely replaced as our understanding of the universe has gotten better. Like his particle theory of light. Groundbreaking, but not the full story. Right. But that's the beauty of science, isn't it? It's always mm. evolving, always seeking to like refine and expand what we know. It's like we're all explorers. Orally. Charting this vast, uncharted territory, building upon the maps and the, the discoveries of those who came before us. Great analogy. And Newton's work, it provided some of the earliest and, and most important landmarks on that map. So even his mistakes, even his incomplete theories, they still had value. Definitely. They, like, helped to show the way forward, leading others to explore new paths and, you know, refine our understanding. Science is a journey, not a destination, right? Love that. And speaking of journeys, Newton himself seemed to get this. The quote of his... I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Wow, that's that's powerful. Even with all he accomplished, he still recognized how much was left unknown. Like he was just scratching the surface. Exactly. It's, uh, it's humbling, isn't it? Definitely. It reminds you that even the most brilliant minds are limited by... You know, their time and the tools they have available. And it speaks to that that human drive, you know? To understand the universe, our place in it. It's a powerful thing. Speaking of understanding our place in the universe, I was fascinated by how Newton, later in life, turned his attention to uh, biblical prophecy. Yeah, he got really into the book of Daniel and the apocalypse of St. John, all those texts about, like, the end of the world. And he even made some predictions of his own. Right, he did. Based on his interpretations, he figured the world wouldn't end before 2060. Wow. So the same mind that, like, cracked the laws of motion and gravity mm -hmm. also spent time grappling with these questions of faith. It just shows the range of his curiosity. He wasn't satisfied with just the physical world. He wanted to explore those spiritual metaphysical realms, too. And it really highlights how intertwined science and religion were for him. They weren't separate things. Right. And it's a good reminder that even the most rational minds can be drawn to those big questions of faith and spirituality. I mean, these are the kinds of questions that have been around forever across all cultures. It's a very human thing. Totally. And it's fascinating to think about how someone like Newton, who loved order predictability, reconciled that with the, the inherent uncertainty of faith. But the puzzle for sure. Maybe. For him, both science and religion were just different ways of looking at at the big picture, like each offering its own unique insights. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? Someone who lived over 300 years ago can still spark such interesting conversations. Really speaks to the power of his ideas, I guess. Yeah, for sure. It really makes you wonder, right? Like how differently would Newton have approached things if he'd had, I don't know, access to all the stuff we have today? I know. Like imagine giving Newton a supercomputer or one of those like powerful space telescope. What would he have come up with? It's really something to think about. It is. But, you know, it also makes you appreciate just how ingenious he was, even with the limited tools he had back then. Definitely. A true pioneer. He really laid the groundwork for, well, for everyone who came after him in science. Yeah, pushing those boundaries of knowledge. And speaking of pushing boundaries, it's important to remember, right, Newton wasn't perfect, even with all that genius. Of course not. No one is. Like any scientist, I mean, he made mistakes. Some of his theories have been, well, revised, updated as our understanding of the universe has progressed. Like the particle theory of light, right? <laughs> Groundbreaking at the time. But turns out it wasn't the whole story. Yeah, exactly. But that's science, right? It's always evolving. It's all about this constant process of discovery and, and refining what we know. Like we're all explorers in a way. Charting this vast, I mean, incredibly vast territory. And building on what those before us discovered, their maps and their findings. So even his mistakes, yeah. those theories that weren't totally complete, 
They still had a purpose, didn't they? For sure. They helped to light the way, you know, showing others where to go next, what to explore, encouraging them to, to keep refining our understanding. Science is definitely a journey, not some destination you just arrive at. You got it. And Newton, well, he seemed to understand that. Remember that quote? I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and averting myself in now and then, finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Man, that's, that's a really beautiful quote. Even with all his achievements, he could still acknowledge how much more there was to discover. Yeah, like he was just getting started. It's pretty humbling when you think about it. Totally. Reminds us that even the most I don't know, the most brilliant lines out there, they're still limited by their time, the technology they have, all of that. And it really speaks to that human desire, that drive to understand the universe, where we fit into it, the whole thing. It's a pretty incredible thing, that drive. Speaking of understanding our place in the universe, it was so interesting to me how Newton, in his later years, really got into biblical prophecy. Oh, yeah, he really dug into it, especially <laughs> the book of Daniel and the apocalypse of St. John, all that, uh, you know, end of the world stuff. And he actually made his own predictions based on all that, right? He did. From what he figured out, he thought the world wouldn't end before, get this, 2060. Wow. So the guy who, like, figured out the laws of motion, gravity, spent time thinking about this stuff, too. Yeah. The fate of humanity, all of that. Yeah. I mean, it shows how broad his curiosity was. He wasn't just content with the physical world, you know. He wanted to understand the spiritual side, the metaphysical stuff, too. It's a really cool reminder that even the most, I don't know, the most rational people can still be drawn to these big questions of faith. You know, what happens after we die? What's the point of it all? That kind of thing. It's a human thing, I think, to wonder about these things. It's been happening for centuries all over the world. It is. It's something we all share. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground here today. We have explored Newton's discoveries, those laws of motion, his work with light, his religious views, even got into his personality a bit, his rivalry with Leibniz. It's been quite a journey. It really has. I hope everyone listening has a better sense of, you know, who Newton was, the complexity of his life and his work. I think so, too. He was an amazing thinker, a man who was incredibly curious about, well, pretty much everything. And he changed the way we see the universe and ourself, our place in it. And his work, it still inspires us today, you know, to explore, to ask those tough questions, to keep searching for a deeper understanding of it all and to never lose that sense of wonder. That's at the heart of science, really. Couldn't have said it better myself. <sighs> so to everyone listening out there, we encourage you to keep digging into Newton's world, read his work, learn about his <laughs> I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. And who knows what amazing things you might discover in that vast ocean. Exactly. So keep exploring, keep those questions coming, and keep that spirit of discovery burning bright. Until next time, keep diving deep. <laughs>